Hello and welcome to Chapter 5. My name is Mike Price. I'll be helping you out with this indefinite integration and differential equations first section. So, learning objectives. Study and compute indefinite integrals. That's kind of the, that's where we'll start out with this first video. Uh, explore differential equations and initial value problems. Set up and solve separable differential equations. We'll have a couple of follow-up videos to tackle those. So getting us started, we're basically walking into this section assuming that all of us recall how to differentiate stuff. That is, you know how to find the derivative of some function. And now, as is typical in mathematics, we're going to try to walk this backwards. Essentially, if we start with some thing that we believe to already be the derivative of a function, could we figure out what the original thing was? So anti-differentiation is precisely that idea. So this, there's this tradition to use this like capital F and lowercase f business, so we'll try to minimize the, the damage there. But do remember that in math, typically, uppercase f and lowercase f do not have to be related variables or names of functions. They can be different things. So in this case, they are related to the extent that this capital F thing is an antiderivative of f of x. So in other words, what that means is if we take this big F thing, find its derivative, what we end up with is little f. So the focus is still on the, this little f, where this is the thing we start out knowing, and our process as we, as we build one is going to be to try to figure out what is the capital F that goes along with that. So like most things, this doesn't really make sense until we try out an example. So let's, let's do a quick one here. So the question fundamentally is, what is the original thing if you know that the derivative of it is 4x cubed? And this might be a good time if you're the type of person who likes to kind of ponder this stuff. You might pause for a second, uh, pause the video that is, and, and, and think about this for a moment before I spoil it. So uh, it turns out there's actually multiple answers. Uh, so if, this, if this, this could have been one of your answers. So one answer is that the original thing, this little f of x, could be x to the fourth. So in other words, right, if we look at this and we say, if I take the this function, find its derivative, I hope you'll agree that we would, we would get 4x cubed out of this. But um, you might notice there's, there's sort of, uh, well, okay, so just to finish justifying, so if we take the derivative, here's our little derivative operator, this says take the derivative of x to the fourth, and that should give us 4x cubed. So for those, those uh, English buffs out there, just going back to our anti-differentiation definition, you might notice a little subtlety here. This does say an antiderivative, the, the indefinite article, <laughs> not the antiderivative. So an antiderivative implies there could be more than one of these things. And in, and in fact, that actually is the case. So we'll, we'll talk about, we'll revisit this example in just a moment, but here is what we're going to refer to as the fundamental property of antiderivatives, because we just need to make everything sound as awesome as possible. So this fundamental property says, if f, and, and here's this, uh, indefinite article again, is an antiderivative, so any antiderivative. Uh, we do want continuity here. Some funky things can happen if we have discontinuous functions, but right, we, most of the stuff we deal with can be drawn without picking up our pencil. So uh, we're usually in safe territory when we say continuous function. Then any other antiderivative has this form. So we're kind of setting up the problem and then mostly solving it in, in the same step. So the, the initial problem is, oh look, it sounds like there could be more than one antiderivative. We didn't run into this problem with the derivative. We took a function, we had a single, a unique derivative that would come out of that, and then we were done. It turns out walking this backwards, we run into some issues. But then we immediately resolve that issue by saying, look, sure, if you find any antiderivative, so if you find one answer, the rest of them will be different from this only by some constant. And this is actually a pretty handy situation because this means that, for instance, if we, if we know of some capital F of X thing that, that suits our purposes here, oh good, I'm going to bring my third grade scrawl back, um, then that means that if, if there is some other one out there, it's going to look, have the same shape as this, it just might be a little lower. So for instance, this might be that exact same function back again, but with a small modification. For instance, I have purposefully not included a scale here, but maybe this is f of x minus three or something like that. It's the same function, just vertically shifted downward. So uh, 
just one more piece of terminology before we revisit that initial example. Um, you might notice back in that in the first couple of slides it said we can anti-differentiate or find the indefinite integral. And these are just <laughs> great <laughs> words. Um, but essentially, we're, we're going to get ourselves a new set of notation. We had the prime notation for derivatives, and we're going to get this kind of, uh, you know, hole in the violin uh, notation for, for the uh, antiderivative. Um, if you've seen it, there's actually a fairly famous calculus book that has this shape as, as most of the stuff on its covers, which is kind of cool because the integral really does look like the, the, um, the slits that made in a, in, in a violin. But what this is supposed to mean for us is essentially this is like our anti-differentiation symbol. We're, we're taking the antiderivative, finding a family, actually, of antiderivatives for this function f of x. And this is that same dx that you would see in the bottom of the uh, derivative operator. So when we wrote d dx of something, this is that same dx guy coming along. So we, we refer to this as the differential for x. So dx there. So we're saying, look, this whole thing is the antiderivative. That's the same as one antiderivative, any particular one that you find, plus some other constant. And remember, we can think of this visually as any vertical shift up or down in the graph of one of these guys. And the terminology there, we're calling this the indefinite integral of f. And maybe even more precisely, with respect to x, sort of like we say derivative with respect to x. OK, so revisiting this initial example, uh, remember that we were looking at, basically, we were starting with this, this right side. We started with this uh, x to the fourth guy, and we were asking, hey, what could we take the, the, uh, what could we take the derivative of, basically, and, and get to this? So you say, OK, look, if you start off with 4x to the third, um, what could you take the derivative of in, in, uh, in order to get this number? So right, backwards thinking. So there's a whole bunch of answers, and we came up with one of them in that initial example. We said x to the fourth, but actually, uh, and, and so that's a perfectly valid answer. We could write that the capital F of x would be this x to the fourth deal. But there's actually infinitely many other possibilities here. So for instance, we could have come up with another function. I'm just giving it a different name, capital G, that is also x to the fourth. It still has this same commonality. Basically, all the variable components are, are the same. The only thing that's different is it's got this potential for an extra constant. So our, our plus c, basically, uh, we're saying, look, in this case, it's minus 2. You could actually even imagine this as having sort of an invisible plus 1 as, a, as an extra constant. But, right, and, and remember why this is the case. Because with, if you start with either of these functions and you take its derivative, remember that the derivative of a constant is just going to disappear anyway. So the concern, basically, if you go back to the starting problem is, look, here I want to find anything that, uh, that is an antiderivative of 4x to the third. But because the derivative kills off any constants, then we're going to have uh, an issue trying to sort of resuscitate that, if you will. We won't be able to recover whatever constant was part of this function because the derivative killed it off. So we just have to acknowledge, hey, any constant could have worked. We're just not sure. Okay, so with that initial deal aside, let's see if we can try to find antiderivatives of some common things. So, uh, the, I'm, I, like most things, examples will make these a lot clearer, but uh, th this is sort of running through the majority of the stuff that we did in our first uh, differential calculus class. So, how to deal with constants? Well, if you have a constant, then any sort of linear function would have its derivative be a constant, and, and vice versa. So uh, if you start off with a linear function, its derivative is definitely going to be a constant. This is saying, no matter what, if you, if you want to anti-differentiate a constant, it's going to come from some kind of line, basically. More broadly, if you have x to any power, then we're going to use the power rule. And if you remember that for the derivative, we would subtract one from this exponent, or, well, we, we would bring down the exponent and then subtract one from its power. This is the exact opposite process. We are going to first add one to the exponents. We go up to n plus 1, and then uh, divide by that new exponent. So these guys are all the same, basically. And if you notice this commonality all the way through, we've all got these plus c's on them, because they all represent families of functions. So they're all some vertical shift off from one another. Logarithmic rule says uh, if, you start, if you want the integral of 1 over x, then you end up with natural log of x. 
for those of you who are uh, paying very, very close attention, you might say, wait a moment, 1 over x is x to the n. This is just x to the negative 1 power. So why are you giving me a different rule here? Well, you might notice there's also this stipulation, which feels sort of heavy-handed, like, no, you don't get to use n equals negative 1. We're just feeling punitive today. Um, that's not really it, actually. So if you notice, if n was negative 1, then this would be x to the, well, 0, negative 1 plus 1. That in and of itself, not a huge deal. x to the 0, we can manage. However, then we're supposed to divide by that power. So then we have negative 1 plus 1. Yeah, 0 in the denominator, that's a problem. So that's actually why we're leaving off this negative 1 option, because it would cause us to divide by 0. But all is not lost. If x really was, if this really was x to the negative 1, what we really have is natural log. Uh, so if you recall, derivative of natural log gives us 1 over x. So that's actually exactly what we would expect. Um, you may wonder about these little absolute value bars. That's important too, mostly so that the domain of this thing matches the domain of the inside function. Uh, we won't get too much into that now. This will come up again later on. But uh, natural log would only be defined for positive values of x, whereas 1 over x is fine for anything except 0. So to, basically, to get these things to, to match up, then we'd say, OK, look, let's just put absolute values around this. That'll make sure that this is positive, at least. And now, only x, is, x equals 0 is a problem for either of these two functions. Last but not least, we have the exp exponential rule. And this is basically like the, you know, the derivative in reverse. You're not going to kill off an e to the x kind of situation with the derivative or, in this case, an antiderivative. It's going to stick around, and, and the only thing that's going to make it out of that is an ex this extra constant. So uh, instead of multiplying by k with the derivative, we're dividing by k. So let's see if we can do one quick example. Uh, I realize I'm already running out of time on this one. Um, so our task is find the family of antiderivatives corresponding to this bad boy. So no word problems or anything yet, just trying a slightly more expansive example that's going to ask us to combine some stuff. So one of the rules we've kind of left unwritten is essentially that just like with the derivative, subtraction and addition, or rather I should say subtraction and addition, might as well circle the correct things when I say them, uh, can separate over antiderivatives just like they did for derivatives. We can sort of break up these integrals over these pieces. And actually, that's exactly what we want to do. So we'll break up each term over addition and subtraction. And I'll kind of try to track these uh, pieces here, just so we can see if we can hold on to them. So here's our x squared guy. This whole deal now becomes uh, its own integral, because it's separated from the rest by subtraction. Um, you might also notice that these things are holding on to uh, the integral symbols as we go. So this, this antiderivative, this indefinite integral symbol, is attached to this guy, and it gets its own dx. You can sort of think about these as left and right parentheses. We need an, uh, an integral symbol to open the antiderivative, and we need a differential to close it off to let us know which variable we're, we're treating here. So the next thing that's separated by subtraction or addition is this 2 uh, times the square root of x deal. He gets his own antiderivative expression there in the middle. And then last but not least, well, OK, probably least. What color are we going to go with? Let's go yellow. Oh, perfect. Nice choice, Mike. Now we get no color. Mm, green it is. Go ducks. So now we've got one. It's all by itself uh, in this new integral. So we've successfully separated each of these things over subtraction and addition. Now, right, thinking ahead, no, we're not going to think about this, this carefully every time we do antiderivatives moving forward, most likely. Who knows? Maybe your teacher will, will want you to spell this out every time. But it is important, at least in this initial example, that we think about this carefully so that we're not making mistakes, making poor assumptions about what we can and cannot do with these indefinite integrals. So we've got another rule that we can make use of. And I'll put this back in blue again because it goes along with this guy. Uh, this, too, is a constant multiple. It really is important that this be constant, not have any variable stuff in it. Uh, but basically, just like with the derivative, we can pull this out and treat it as a factor just in front of, uh, of this expression. So 
there's the two getting pulled out. And again, this is not something moving forward that we will show with regularity, but it'll be happening every single time, whether or not it's part of our work. So really, oh, and then uh, one other convenient thing we did there was to rewrite the square root of x as x to the one half power. Hopefully you recall our rules of fraction exponents and how the one half power really is the same thing as the square root. Okay, so it turns out we're in really good shape at this point. Uh, where What we can manage is that the integral of x squared, all of these pieces, but in particular this first guy, look like power rule. They look like x to some power. And our rule says, great, you have x squared, then you turn that into x to the 2 plus 1, we add 1 to the power, and then we divide by that new exponent, so that 2 plus 1 is now our denominator. And then we do the same thing, but with our uh, expression here in the middle. We've got this extra 2 factor that's just going to kind of hang out for a minute, but the real action is with x to the 1 half. Take a 1 half power, add 1 to it, you end up with, well, we'll simplify in just a sec, but right, this should be 3 halves and then we divide by that new exponent, 1 half plus 1. And then finally, uh, we had integral of 1 dx, which is about the least in interesting integral you can get. Um, some folks will just write this as integral dx, and that's cool too, but I don't know, it's kind of nice to see what the actual constant is there. Same thing though. And there we have our exponent, and so this doesn't look like x to some power, at least initially, but it, it really is. We did this with derivatives too, but um, this is really the same thing as x to the zero, so power rule does apply. We get to increase that power by one, divide by the new exponent, and so this is going to end up being basically just x. And then this will get you every time, but um, I actually knew one calculus teacher who had a little stamp that he would use to grade with, and it was a plus c stamp because it's so frequent that students would forget to, you know, they do this antiderivative stuff, but they would forget to acknowledge that this is a whole family of functions, not just one function, and they're all separated by this constant. So plus c has got to go on the end of our antiderivatives to acknowledge that there's actually infinitely many possible uh, vertical shifts that, that would, all be, uh, would all have the same derivative. Right, so we applied the power rule three times, and then for each of these three little expressions here, and then cleaning all that up, we'd have x to the three divided by three. We'd have, uh, this is three halves, so we'd actually do that whole invert and multiply deal, get four thirds out in front, x to the three halves power. This whole big fraction just turns into plain old x, and then we'd have c. And, uh, so, you know, for those of you so inclined to box stuff, this seems like a good thing to reward ourselves for uh, having completed with a, a nice, satisfying box around it. Okay, so there's the whole family of antiderivatives. One parking you try problem, because it should have a similar feel to it. Now, it is a variable t instead, but uh, it yeah, this, this ought to be very similar to what we just managed a moment ago. So I'll let you give that a try, and I'll see you for next video.